Women divorce men 70 to 80 percent of the time. So to a guy's point of view, he's going to commit to this girl. And what does he get? He doesn't get purity anymore. He doesn't he doesn't get youth anymore. So he doesn't get either of those things. A lot of times she already has a kid. So yeah, on top of that, even if he does find a good woman that maybe has the qualities he's looking for, he, she was going to want him to marry her. And what does he get out of that? Oh, she can leave and take half and take my kids. And she's paid to take my kids away from me. She she gets more money if she takes my children. Mm -hmm. And so from the men's point of view, they're just kind of like it because like women aren't wives nowadays. Hey guys, I'm Hannah Cox with Base Politics. Welcome back to my show, Histrionics, where every week I'm discussing issues that pertain to women and bringing you more of a centrist point of view. Please pardon my plain background. At the moment, I am in the process of combining houses with my fiance. We're selling one house. We're moving into another. We're building a new studio. I'll have a new background soon. Bear with us in the process. It's a lot to do. Quick reminder, if you like this episode, make sure you subscribe to the channel, leave me a like and a comment. As you can tell from my opening video, we are coming in hot today. I want to talk about divorce and answer the question, do women really win at divorce? Now, according to the red pill community, the men's rights movement, the men going their own way movement, the trad con movement, the pickup artists, like honestly, I can't even keep track of all these little groups they have for themselves online. But according to the men and bizarrely, a couple women who make up these online organizations, movements, coalitions, I don't even know what you call them. According to them, women are having a marvelous, excellent time ruining marriages and getting divorced. But the people that make it to the very top, the Bill Gates, the Steve Jobs, they have a bunch of things going for them. It's not just hard work. It's also circumstance, fortune, where they are, what, you know, who's around them, who, who, who encourages them. There's, there's a bunch of what time they were born and what, you know, what age they were when th certain things happened in the world. There's a bunch of factors. But for all those chicks, it's just marrying the right dude. <laughs> Getting no. divorced. Getting paid. I know a lady who uh, just got paid from a divorce, and she's just shooting shit into her face and banging 20-year-olds now. It's hilarious. She's in her late 40s. Bang at 20 year old dudes. They frequently point to data that shows women are more likely to end divorce. They claim that when women do get divorced, they are making out like bandits. When they are presented with stats like the fact that single women are now purchasing and owning homes at a higher level than single men, they will claim this is because they just divorced well. According to a lot of these men, any woman who has money got it via divorce. And basically, women as a whole are just looking to grift off men, marry them for a few years, pop out a few kids, and then kick back after they clean them out in divorce. Now, interestingly enough, I first encountered these issues not online, but in real life, because my now fiance is divorced. And when we first started chatting, I was pretty surprised to hear about some of the things he went through in the court system during that process. This was during the time that I was making my original series of base, and so I actually ended up doing an entire episode digging into the court system and how it dealt with men both in divorce and especially in divorces when there were kids present. And I was pretty surprised at some of the things I found. You can go back and watch that video at length, but as I say within it, there are many things that I think should change in that process. As a true feminist, I believe in the equality of the sexes under the law. That is the basic definition of feminism. And I would say that right now, under the law and the court system, we don't always have equality between the genders. So it seems like there is some work to do. For example, barring some kind of abuse, I think parents should automatically get 50-50 custody. I also think child support should be reevaluated regularly and that there should be some kind of a time limit in which both partners are expected to get to a place where they can adequately provide for their kids. I don't believe in this whole like keep the households equal thing. You're an adult, you can work, five years gives you time to build a career where you should be able to earn a sustainable income. I think at that point, you should be able to provide a basic standard of living for your kids without your ex's help. I also think there should be a better way of allocating child support when it is granted to ensure it goes directly to the kid. Maybe like some kind of a mutual fund that would be run like an HSA where that money could only be used towards certain products or services or needs that the kid has. I could also see some arguments for changing some of the practices around alimony, but I just don't want to get too sidetracked here. So if you want to dig into some of that, my views on it, please go back and watch the old episode. Today, I want to focus on this entire premise that women get to clean men out and divorce and see, is it true? And if it's not true and women actually happen to fare worse in divorce, then I think it's time to question 
why are so many women filing for divorce? Because I think it might point to the fact that many of them are more desperate in their situations than you would think. Oftentimes, when a woman ends a relationship, you will hear the man claim that she left me over nothing. But in reality, that's very rarely the case in my experience. Most of the time, the woman has done significant work. They have tried to get the man to go to therapy, to go to couples counseling with them. They've tried to get the man to work on issues. They've asked to have equitable support and taking care of the kids and the home, and they haven't gotten it. They're burnt out, they're exhausted, and often on top of all of that, you'll hear things like they cheated on them, they mistreated them, they were abusive towards them, they were disrespectful towards them. I just very rarely believe the assertion that women are leaving men over nothing. So if it's true that women are the ones filing about 70% of divorces, I want to know why that is. And if it's not because it's a get-rich-quick scheme, then I think we need to talk about some of the things men are doing leading to those rates. I'm breaking up with the guy I'm dating because of what he did to me while I was on the toilet the other day, and I'm not joking like i'm being so serious right now so i'm at his house i sit down to take a poop right i go to wipe there's no toilet paper i'm like damn hey babe could you please grab me some toilet paper he said no i already told you that bathroom's out of toilet paper sorry i'm like oh yeah i forgot you told me this bathroom's out of toilet paper regardless could you please just run downstairs and grab me some real fast he said no i already told you like you're gonna have to figure it out like i told you already so with shit in my ass i explained to him how he's my only option i can't walk downstairs and get the toilet paper he's gonna have to go down and get it for me he just is refusing he says no and then he asks me did you go number one or number two because if you just peed you can use the towel right there to wipe i said there's actually no fucking world where i will be using our bath towel to wipe my ass no absolutely not and i actually can't believe you just said that to me like i really can't believe that and then he starts ignoring me like i'm like hey please please he's just not responding like he's just ignoring me i hear his phone like scrolling through fucking videos and i get pissed i'm like okay well if you're not gonna go i'm gonna start screaming for help like i'm gonna start screaming he's still your man i go help help me to the neighbors because i'm like bro i need help and he finally fine 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 i'll go what the fuck you're so fucking dramatic and then he finally storms off goes downstairs he comes back slams the door open and he throws the toilet paper at my fucking head I cried. I did. And no, that's actually one of the craziest things anyone's ever done to me. And just to be candid, before I even started really researching and prepping for this episode, the conversations I have been hearing from women online when it comes to divorce are very different from the ones I hear men having in these extremely online communities. TikTok is a platform that is used by more women than men. And so it's actually a great place to go to hear anecdotally what women's experiences are. And many of them are being very forthcoming around their experiences of getting married and divorced. And contrary to the narrative that's being pushed by the red pill community, none of them really seem to be all that sad about their divorces. They aren't worried about getting old alone. They aren't frantically trying to date and get another husband. But what I hear them saying is that they are often working longer hours. They have less money than when they were married. They have more time that they are expected to take care of the kids. And they're still happier and feel like they have less work because the burden of taking care of a grown man has been lifted from their shoulders. I'm not exaggerating when I say that every single divorced woman that I know is happier now than when she was married. It doesn't matter if she's 60, if she's 20, if she has kids, if she had to go back to school, if she had to go back to work. Every single one of them looks better, feels better, acts better, and appears to be thriving. Or at least just not miserable like they were when they were married. And on the flip side, the majority of their husbands are not doing well. I think that's pretty telling. So as you can see, just anecdotally, the conversations that I happen to be in online are very different than the ones the red pill keeps trying to assure women are happening. Older women seem to be saying, I got married, it was a bad deal, I had kids, I was miserable, I couldn't get support, it was so dire and desperate, I was willing to file and leave and even take a financial hit and I'm still happier for it. But I wanted to see, does the research back up the conversations I'm hearing? So let's do some digging. According to a study published by the U.S. Government Accountability Office, women's household income fell by an average of 41% following a divorce, while men's household income fell by only 23%. And while some progress has been made over the last several decades, husbands still make an average of 69% more than their wives. Now, I want to be clear to point this out. That is not because there is a gender pay gap. That is because women choose less profitable careers. I'm so tired of that narrative. It has been debunked over and over. It's a left-wing talking point and it's not true. If you choose to go into a high income earning field and you have the same education and you work the same hours and the amount of time as your male counterparts, you will make the same. And if you are not, it's illegal. It's been illegal since like 1963. But 
women overall choose careers that pay less money, like being a teacher. They tend to choose careers that take less time, where they have more flexible schedules. And yes, we can argue about why that is, and perhaps it has a lot to do with the fact that they are expected to pick up more of the work in their relationships and in parenting and in their household. But there's not some scam to pay women less, just to be clear. All that to say, though, the reality is still that men do tend to make more than women, and so when women leave a marriage, they tend to take more of a financial hit. Furthermore, 56% of women report that they deferred to their spouse on financial planning and investment decisions. So it's not really all that surprising that when they go to get divorced, they're not in a position of power where they can really negotiate for themselves. They often don't have that strong of an idea about what the financial landscape actually looks like in their relationship, where all the money even is. Oftentimes, they don't really have the skill set they need to manage money. I think that's a huge failing of our school system and parents. Women need to be given those same financial tools as men, but in practice, they often do not have them. Statistics from the United States Census Bureau also show that approximately 80% of custodial parents are mothers. So not only do women tend to make less money, especially following a divorce, but they also are spending more of their time taking care of their kids and also paying for childcare when they cannot take care of their kids. Now, obviously the red pill talking point is that this is because courts are stealing kids from their fathers. Evil mothers are keeping them away from their fathers. Fathers really want to be more involved and they don't get to be involved. And so this is a huge failure of the court system. But there's not really much to back that up, actually. In fact, the data shows the opposite. The most recent data I found also from the United States Census Bureau shows that fathers represent around one in five custodial parents, which is an improvement over the 16% that they had around 1994. But what the studies show is that dads are simply not asking for custody and that when they do, they tend to get it. One Massachusetts study examined 2,100 fathers who asked for custody and pushed aggressively to win it. Of those 2,100 people, 92% either received full or joint custody with mothers receiving full custody only 7% of the time. The facts around this are that things have changed rapidly. It did tend to be very automatic for courts to award custody to the mother, but that was decades ago. There's now been extensive work showing how damaging that is for a kid. There has been laws pushed in many states to try to reform that. Judges have become more informed on these matters. The problem more often than not these days is that men are simply not doing the work they need to do to get their kids. It's not that hard. You just need to hire an attorney and actually go and fight for it. But what the statisticians believe is happening is that men are taught that they don't have a chance of getting their kids. They're predisposed to believing that. And so they give up before they even try. They think it's going to be a huge waste of time and money. They don't put forth the effort at all. Now, unfortunately, there are still a lot of men and women who will use their kids manipulatively to try to harm the other partner in divorce. It's disgusting. I think those people are abhorrent. I can't stand it, whether it's men or women participating in that behavior. It's damaging to kids. It is abusive. It should count against them in the court system. That should be able to be documented and submitted when they're doing that kind of thing. And to that, I would say, you need to be really careful who you have kids with. I, mm, if there is one thing that I think parents undersell, man, I don't know. To daughters, I feel like we do a pretty good job of scaring women into having kids with men who won't provide. And I think obviously women have like a little bit more of a biological evolutionary instinct to care about those things because they obviously have to put their bodies through the process of having kids. And so they're less likely to have kids with a deadbeat or somebody who's not going to be a good father, not have good character, not participate in the kids' lives. But obviously there are still a lot of women who do procreate with abusive assholes. But what I don't think we do a good job of is teaching men to avoid procreating with crazy. You see it all too often. Men oftentimes are valuing the wrong things in the women that they choose as partners and the women that they choose as mothers. And boy, do they pay for it in the long run. And I got to say, I'm not going to feel bad for these red pill guys when it comes for them. Because when all you care about is how young a woman is, how hot she is, you don't want a woman who has a job, you don't want a woman who has an education, you don't want a girl boss, guess what you get? Women with low quality values, women with no work ethic, women with no ambition, women who don't have a lot of wisdom or intelligence, and women who will then use you and screw you over one day. And guess what? When you have kids with somebody, it's a lot easier for them to do that. There's only so much a person can do to you in a typical divorce, but when there's kids involved, they've got you for 18 years. So yes, things can go very awry if you do have kids with a bad person and you end up in these situations. And there are things that we can and should be doing to ensure that they are more fair. But as a whole, men can get custody of their kids most of the time if they try. And more often than not, it's that they're not trying to. And that's a whole other conversation. Now, another thing that often gets brought up in these discussions is around the child support allocations that happen once custody is decided. Obviously, 
since more women are getting custody of their kids, the father is then expected to pay. One thing that would alleviate this problem for a lot of men is if they fought for 50-50 of their kids in the first place. If you don't want to pay child support, show up and take care of your kid 50% of the time. And while I did mention that I do think many of the ways they calculate child support are unfair and that it shouldn't just be this like one-time verdict that then just lasts throughout the course of the rest of your working life until the kid's 18, the reality is in about 45.6% of cases where child support is awarded to a woman, the man simply does not pay. And additionally, I've heard of very few cases where a man is being ordered to pay some crazy amount. Having a kid is expensive. Clothing a kid, paying for their transportation, paying for their other interests outside of school, vacations, technology, all of these things add up. If you didn't plan to have to pay for the kid, why did you have the kid? When you think about the fact that women are still four out of five custodial parents as of right now, and almost Almost half of them are not getting the child support they were allocated. What that means is women are also having to pick up that tab, which is another factor that is making them far more likely to end up in poverty post-divorce rather than rolling in riches. I think what often happens is that we hear of these like outlier cases, right? You hear about a Bill Gates getting divorced and some crazy sum being allocated. But in reality, when you dig into the everyday averages, it's something like $500 a month to take care of two kids. That's really not going that far. Now, one caveat I would say here is if there is 50-50 custodial care, I don't think one parent should be having to pay the other long-term. And we do still see too much of that happening. But again, if you end up in one of those situations, you probably were married to a pretty good guy who didn't screw you over because this is definitely not the norm. Now, another thing that gets brought up a lot in conversations around divorce is this notion that women get to keep the house. As I mentioned, there's been a lot of data going around lately showing single women now own more houses than single men. And of course, all of the single men who don't own houses will say this is just because they got them in divorce. But that, again, is just not really backed up by the data. Because most Americans are not rich, do not even have a $1,000 in savings, and probably have a good bit of debt, all of that has to be split up when you go to get divorced. And because a home is typically the American family's largest asset, that means that home usually has to be sold in order to settle those debts and have anything left to split. Furthermore, when women do get to keep the house in a divorce, it often doesn't even go that well for them. Homes require a lot of maintenance and upkeep, and all of a sudden you have to pay all those bills by yourself when formerly you were doing it with two people and two incomes. So homes can become a real money pit, and many women would often be better off if they were to sell that house and downsize and put their money in better appreciating items like pension funds or retirement funds. Speaking of retirement, here's another area where women don't fare that well in divorce. In a recent survey of approximately 1,800 women in various stages of a divorce process, 72% did not choose saving for retirement as a main financial concern. That's a scary statistic given that women's average life expectancy is 81.1 years, five years longer than that of men. Shockingly, the average divorced woman over age 65 had a median annual household income of $35,736, which is nearly $32,000 less per year than married women in the same age group. I can think of few things more terrifying than being in your 60s, approaching retirement, not having a good annual salary, and having nothing to fall back on. If the woman was staying home while her husband was working over the years, that means his retirement was building while hers was not. Now, some of that could get split up in a divorce, but since it seems like women are not prioritizing that, that means it probably oftentimes is not. So to summarize all this data around divorce, I want to refer to a study by the National Library of Medicine that looked into it, and they found the key domain in which large and persistent gender differences emerge where women's disproportionate losses in household income and associated increases in the risk of poverty and single parenting. Taken together, these findings suggest that men's disproportionate strain of divorce is transient, whereas women's is chronic. So yeah, when you get divorced as a man, it probably will suck for a couple years, but women are going to feel the effects a whole lot longer on average. So with all this data pretty regularly available, I have to ask why these male groups continue to push these narratives that are patently untrue. And even when they're presented with data, they will argue with you until they are blue in the face. This is a live reenactment. Women get everything after divorce. They benefit so much more than men. They get all the money, all the property, all the alimony, all the child support. Well, actually, um, here's three different sources that say otherwise. It actually says that women fare far worse after divorce, um, they're actually more likely to end up in poverty and lose home ownership. And um, most cases aren't granted alimony. Only about 10% are. And if they are granted, it's not in perpetuity. Well, then they take 
all the children. They never let them see their children. And kids from broken homes are so much worse than society. Well, actually, um, when men actually asked for custody, 92% of the time they were granted custody, but most men don't ask, therefore most judges don't grant it. Well, I know hundreds of men that have been wronged by the system, that have had all their money taken from them by money hungry women. Your lived experience does not equate to factual data. But I know guys that it's happened to. I just cited sources to prove that that is not what happens the majority of the time. You're just a cunt. So since it's very clear, most women are not getting filthy rich or walking into some kind of like life on easy street post-divorce, why is it that 75% of them are initiating these processes? According to divorce.com, the top seven reasons are one, unmet needs, two, a deficient life work balance, three, husband's unfaithfulness, four, alcohol addiction, five, physical and emotional violence, six, needing a better support system, seven, fewer regrets. I think divorce seems horrible. It's something I would never want to go through. It's certainly something I would never want to put a kid through. But if anything, what that means is that we need to be encouraging people to have better values that they're seeking in partners to take their time and evaluating people before they rush into these very consequential lifetime decisions with people. We shouldn't be rushing people to get married young before their brains are fully formed. And we should be having more conversations about the reasons why women are more likely to leave. I've always thought it was so stupid to run around and be like, 75% of women initiate divorce. As if just because somebody files the paperwork, they're the reason the marriage didn't work out. Women are more likely to do the paperwork. They're more likely to do all the work in the marriage. So it's not surprising they're the ones that file the paperwork when something goes wrong. But it doesn't mean that that's what they actively want. I don't think anybody goes into a marriage wanting it to fall apart. But when they are consistently not getting their needs met, not getting the support that they need, when they are living with abuse and mistreatment, they will eventually hit a wall and they will decide to leave and go it alone. And oftentimes they will take a financial hit to do that and they will still be happier. What does that tell you about the state of marriage in this country? It's really not men who need to be as afraid of getting married to the wrong person. It's women based on this data. And it's especially women who go into marriages and give up all of their financial control. This whole push for women to be trad wives, I think, is very ill-fated, very misguided, and quite dangerous for women. It's also dangerous for men, to be honest. If you're really worried about like a woman like gold digging and cleaning you out one day, which, by the way, never have I met a single man who's worried about that, that has any gold. Like I'm convinced there's not a single outlier. Rich men are not worried about this. It's only like four men, but I digress. If you're really worried about that, one way to ensure it doesn't happen is for you both to work the entire time. Because if you're both working, you're both earning income, it is far less likely you're gonna have to pay out alimony or child support or all these other factors that men are so consumed with in the red pill community. But for women, it is especially dangerous and I think frankly naive to put yourself in these situations. There are very good reasons that second wave feminists fought so hard for women to have the right to work, to open bank accounts, to have their own credit cards, to get their own business loans. I don't agree with much of where the third wave of feminism has gone, but the second wave, absolutely, in solidarity, lockstep. And honestly, it shows a shocking knowledge of history to believe otherwise, to think that 50, 60 years ago, women were just so happy and content not working and being in the home. People don't start revolutions when they're happy and comfortable. Get a grip. I actually saw an excellent thread from a woman named Dr. Laura Robinson on Twitter regarding this last night that I want to read to you. She said, one of my working theories for the emergence of the quote, trad wife aesthetic is that it depends a lot on disconnection from women who were actually adults in the 1950s and 60s. I grew up in a lot of highly intergenerational spaces and the idea that we'd lost some sort of golden age was just never available to me. Everyone was aware of women who had been homemakers and then dealt with spousal alcoholism, abuse, incestuous abuse of the children, infidelity, abandonment, etc. And when I look at statistics from that year, it seems like this wasn't unusual. But if you grow up far from your grandparents and aren't in intergenerational spaces at church, it's easy to grow up thinking that ads for Maytag washing machines depicted real life and don't realize that that's not how it worked. To add to this a little more, you can't explain any societal movement with all of a sudden people who were happy decided they didn't want to be happy anymore. That's not how things work. Second wave feminism was not the result of lots of happy women who had it all deciding they couldn't take another minute of things being so rosy. Second wave feminism came from widespread female misery. So in light of that, I do want to appreciate the fact that women who are reacting against the way things are now are also unhappy and men. They don't want to work as hard as they have to for so little. They don't want to be pulled apart between parenting and work. They don't want to have such a hard time finding someone they want to marry, etc. And I appreciate that. I think people are reacting against a real feeling that the way we live sucks and it isn't working. 
But you're not going to get that by making the mistakes we have already made. Feminism didn't cause this. Women before you fought to protect you from living their hell. Now you have to do something scarier. Fight to stop ours. Not by rolling back the clock, not by fantasy, but with real policy changes that will make a flourishing life possible for more of us because that's not behind us. I understand that where a lot of these conversations are coming from are the fact that women and men are unhappy. They're not doing well. They're not able to find equal partners. They're not thriving. But we don't get better by going back to the past. We get better by imagining new ways of doing things. That takes guts. That takes vision. And unfortunately, a lot of people don't have those things. But TikTok is full of women who were suckered into doing just that, who gave up their rights, who gave up their financial autonomy, and who bet their entire future on a man always loving them and being attracted to them, which according to the red pill only lasts till you're about 30 years old. So not a good bet. But no, in all seriousness, it's not a smart calculation to make. I want to roll you just one of the many devastating accounts I've seen from women on TikTok who bought into the trad lifestyle and got completely screwed. I want to start this video by saying that I'm not asking for many and I'm not asking for sympathy. What I'm asking for is if you are a young 14, 16, 21 year old girl, listen up. I drove to the grocery store. I need to grab some milk and bread and a couple of things flipped open the pink app on my phone. And I've been sitting in my car crying ever since because I never have enough money. And why do I never have enough money? Because when I was a 19 year old girl, I fell in love. My Mormon faith told me that I was supposed to be a stay at home mom. I got married. I started having babies. I dropped out of college. I never had a career. My only jobs that I ever had in life were a waitress at the Olive Garden and managing a pretzel maker in a mall. Oh, my first couple years of marriage, I decided that I wanted to be an entrepreneur. So I bought a windshield business. I was 20. And my Mormon state president reminded me that women weren't supposed to work. So I quit my own business, handed it over to my husband, took my name off of it. I would work our family business throughout the next 24 years of my marriage, but I never got paid. I didn't have a salary. My name wasn't on it. I literally worked for room and board. That's it. I would eventually also launch a custom home building company with my uncle as the architect and my friends as the builder, my designs, my realtor. But again, because my husband was the man, um, his name was on all of the projects. His name was on the business. I remember one of the last custom homes that I built, we sold it and made about a $260,000 profit. That money all went into his bank account. I didn't even have a bank account. I should have said that in the beginning. I never had a bank account. He would give me little envelopes of cash to go grocery shopping with. Anyway, that house sells, the money goes in the bank. Um, I just asked if I could buy myself a piano with the money. I had worked on building that house for two years. All of the money went into his bank account. Nothing was under my name. I got a piano and I got a free house to live in and I got groceries. So I found myself divorced at age 44, just five years ago. And within just a few months, I was living in my car. While he made about a quarter million dollars, he would eventually quit that job so that he wouldn't have to pay alimony and child support. He has only paid alimony one time ever in the five years since we've been divorced. Once ever. Right after my divorce, I remember being really confident about my ability to get a job. So I put together a resume. Um, I remember one of the first interviews that I had this management position for a windshield company, similar to the one that we had run. And the man actually laughing as he was interviewing me, like he was really sympathetic. He wasn't being a douchebag, but he was laughing. And he's like, so, so let me get this straight. You helped manage your family windshield business with your husband, but you were mostly a stay at home mom. And all you did was like the marketing and the hiring, firing and some of the strategy for the business. But it became really apparent that I needed so many more skills to have any type of management job. I couldn't even like work the basic computers. He told me in the interview, please don't apply for any more jobs like this. You are not qualified at all. You're not capable of doing this unless you go back to school and get your degree or get some different experience. And so I ended up, my first job after my divorce was $11 an hour, four hours a day, working as an assistant to a school teacher in an elementary school. I made $44 a day. For 24 years, I lived in million dollar homes. I vacationed all over the world. I spent my summers in Hawaii. I could buy myself $500 jeans, diamond tennis bracelets. We had boats and RVs and whatever I wanted. 
and it never bothered me once that my financial security was dependent on that man being in love with me. I never realized that him liking me or not liking me or finding me sexy or attractive or interesting determined whether or not my children could eat, whether or not I could buy myself a fucking jug of milk and a loaf of bread. So I had my fifth surgery in two years, two weeks ago, and I'm supposed to be in bed resting, and I can't because I've worked seven days a week since my divorce five years ago, which is why I'm covered in paint and looking like crap. We actually have a four day weekend here in Tucson, and since my partner isn't working, he's working on furniture flip partner projects with me. I have no retirement, I have no savings, no education, no resume. I was almost a straight A student throughout all of my education. I went to college at age 17. I had dreams for my future. I'm working so hard to get myself out of just perpetual side hustle hell. There's not a day that goes by that I don't wonder why. Why I didn't have a fucking backup plan. Why my kids eating and having stability was dependent on a romantic relationship. Why nobody told me to put money in the bank. Why nobody told me, don't have babies until you have an education and some experience. Don't have so many kids. I wish somebody had told me to put my name on our vehicle loans and to put my name on our houses. I wish somebody had told me that it's okay to put those babies in daycare for a couple days a week and go to college and have a job. And I think I need to do an entire like trad wife sequel because you can be happy and rich and loving your life like ballerina farm until the guy walks out. I want you guys to imagine for a minute, even rich Hannah, if Deanna walked out, if all of his financial backing and he had to sell the farm, and then what does she have? Find another rich boy to marry? I just don't want one more woman to DM me, comment, send me their stories, cry to me about how hard it is for them to support their families, and I am so tired of living my own story. We have to make this stop. Raise your daughters to be financially independent. Focus on their futures and educations just as much as you focus on your sons. I wish that someone had done that for me. As a whole, you might think you know a person and you can do your best to vet them, but people can always blindside you. So it's always smart to have a prenup. It's always smart to keep your job. It's always smart to have a plan. I think anybody who enters marriage should take it very seriously and work very hard to not get divorced. But at the end of the day, you cannot fully control another person and you need to work to ensure you're not blindsided if something goes south. You also should never place your bets on the government or the court system being fair. Newsflash, our court system is super corrupt. Like go spend one day working criminal justice reform. I've done it for years. You will be shocked at the injustices in that system. So yes, there's a myriad of things we can and should do that would make it more fair, but I wouldn't count on that being the norm. You have to deal with the system that you're currently in, and it happens to be a bit corrupt. People need to treat marriage like a business relationship. Yes, fall in love. Yes, have romance. But at the end of the day, when you enter a legal marriage, you are entering a contract, a business type relationship, a financial partnership, and you need to treat it like this. If you don't, and it comes crashing down on your head, you do still mostly have yourself to blame. But my final verdict when it comes to divorce is it seems like nobody's winning, especially not women, and they're certainly not getting rich in the process. All right, guys, that's a wrap. Leave me a like and a comment. Let me know your thoughts. Don't forget to subscribe to the channel, and I'll see you next week. If you like this episode, don't forget to check out others in my series, Histrionics, here, and you can watch my other weekly show, Hannah Explains It All, here.